right, well, it's 12.02, and why don't we get started? I know there'll be others uh, signing in as we start, but uh, just want to welcome everyone to the resumption of the academic year 2021 Cancer Center Grand Rounds. Uh, I hope that everyone had a chance to at least enjoy a part, if not all, of this beautiful Labor Day weekend that we enjoyed the uh, past few days, and also to enjoy some part of the summer. Um, you know, I have the uh, privilege uh, each Tuesday to introduce the Grand Round speaker. And well, uh, today uh, my job is somewhat simpler because I'm, I'm offering the, uh, the speech today, the talk today. Uh, and specifically, wanted to take the time as we open up this academic year uh, unofficially to uh, share where we're at with the Cancer Center and the Cancer Hospital. Yeah, I think we all know this has been, 2020 has been an extraordinary year and we are living in extraordinary times, really a public health crisis that frankly seemed unimaginable when we started last year. And moreover, um, something that I think this world has not seen in over a century. Um, it has without a doubt tested the mettle of our cancer center and our cancer hospital, our health system, our university. Um, and it has insisted that we find new ways to, uh, to advance the mission of our cancer enterprise with respect to clinical care, research, education, outreach. Some of the things that we've done really since February and March, well, you might even say they were long overdue, uh, like introduction of telehealth. Some, I think, uh, you know, we had to do because we were in the midst of a serious pandemic and some I think involve some real innovation that uh, we'll be pleased to continue hopefully long after this public health event is past us. One thing I think we need to remind ourselves is how much we succeeded, how we really remain true to the mission of our cancer center and to our core values uh, with respect to all components of our mission. And I just want to say that um, you know, I'm always, every day, I'm proud to be a member of this cancer center and this faculty and community and staff, but I, I can't say how, enough how proud I am of everyone in meeting this challenge and at the same time providing care, advancing research, educating, promoting, and providing outreach. And I think we've done so in a way that is exemplary and really, um, something that so many people have shared with me their great admiration. You know, over the next 40 or 45 minutes, I, I wanna recognize what we've accomplished this past year, both with respect to COVID and beyond, and also recognizing that we now begin the next academic year unofficially um, to think about the opportunities ahead and how we get there and hopefully allow some time through the chat function uh, at the end to get your feedback and your questions. So let me now uh, share my screen uh, and, and start. So and just uh, launch the uh, slide view. Well, you know, I, I think it, it, you know, one thing I always want to remind ourselves is the vision. Um, and this is something that is a, something we may continue to revise as part of our strategic planning process, but components of it, I think, are, are without uh, you know, debate, which is we aspire, and I think we are a world leader in care, research, education, and outreach as well, that we uh, are committed to scientific discoveries and care innovations, and that ultimately our goal is to bring about a world free of cancer, delivering that promise to patients. I think implicit in all of this is that um, there is a new model over the past decades of how a cancer enterprise operates. That is this sort of very simple linear function is really not relevant because what our vision statement reflects and frankly what we as an institution have to recognize is that uh, it takes a community of across multiple expertise, disciplines, perspectives, um, to actually achieve great things in cancer care research, education, and outreach. 
And I think this is really what is inherent with where we are today and where we're gonna go in the, in the next decade, embracing all disciplines and the contributions of all so that we can really do great things uh, in battling cancer and eliminating it uh, in this century. We also recognize what are the sort of fundamental pillars that uh, our organization enables uh, to deliver the promise uh, to our community, to the region, and, and uh, to our patients in the world, namely our commitment to clinical care and innovation. As you know, that we're celebrating the, to this year uh, in somewhat muted fashion, the 10th anniversary of the opening of Smilo Cancer Hospital. That's witnessed enormous growth and impact of our clinical enterprise. COVID has certainly put challenges on us in terms of what we needed to do for cancer patients. And I think it has enabled another chapter of innovation. At the same time, um, we've done not only in the past decade, but in the long history of this great cancer center, uh, extraordinary things in research and discovery. Uh, this has been, I think, yet another banner year in our success. And, and in fact, as I'll share with you, as you probably know, how many of our investigators pivoted to, uh, to address this global pandemic. Outreach is something that um, we're committed to, to, bear, to broader communities. And uh, you'll, we'll talk about a little bit over the next 40 minutes, our expanded commitment in that space. Similarly, um, for us to enable this mission, we always have to be mindful of sustainability. That is, how do we support and grow this mission? and how do we do it in a way that takes advantage of all the investments we put forth and all that we try to achieve. And then finally, really in the center of it all are the people and our commitment to training, education, professional development, engagement, diversity, inclusion. I think this is an area that appropriately has gotten more attention, really independent of the, of the pandemic over the past year or longer in our institution and in our cancer center. And I think uh, this is something that I think we want to redouble because at the end, it really is, our success is really a function of the great people that work here. Well, uh, you know, I think the elephant in the room, what, what, has, uh, what has happened since February and March has been uh, extraordinary and um, something we will probably uh, long remember in, in generations to come. And um, this obviously put perhaps one of the greatest challenges in what we're trying to do uh, in cancer care and research. But again, I am just so proud of the response that we've all happened and pursued. Um, flattening the curve was certainly the mantra come early March. And that, as we know, was a challenge. This, of course, as you may recall, is just among the many statistics that would fly by the inpatient census of COVID infected patients at Yale New Haven Hospital, which peaked uh, at around April 21st, um, and certainly put an enormous strain on our institution, uh, and at the same time required us to do lots of other things that actually curtailed our research operations, both in the clinical research and in the bench research arenas. But what we had to do first and foremost was to meet the needs, of the immediate needs of our patients. Um, interestingly, among the great achievements of this past year was the recruitment of two great leaders of our clinical organization, Kim Slusser, who uh, now serves as our Vice President for Patient Services, and Kevin Billingsley uh, as our Chief Medical Officer, and talk about getting thrown into the fire. Um, they both obviously uh, relatively new to the organization, led uh, in such an exceptional fashion. And as you may be aware, built the Smile and Response team in work groups, which met virtually daily. Uh, and um, 60 people on the call with litany of, of work groups that followed to basically redesign care with the principles of how do we continue cancer care? Because Cancer didn't go away during the pandemic. Patients continued to, be, to need care. How did we do that? How did we make sure they were safe? How did we make sure our staff were safe? And to whatever extent we can, 
extend the broader mission. Uh, addressing the issues that you see here in terms of PPE, where we didn't even know where our, our next mask was when this all first started, but ultimately innovating with the rapid, rapid evaluate, Smiler Rapid Evaluation Clinic to ensure that patients who were at risk for COVID, who could be treated, who had need to be treated because they're at risk, had a place for that in terms of new protocols and procedures, redeploying staff across the entire enterprise, implementing telehealth, which we had talked about for years, but actually did so in a way that was virtually seamless. Um, recognizing that we had to ask each of our disease programs to think about how do we continue care if, if surgery or radiotherapy or other components needed to be modified. Moving inpatient units, this we all know, moving out of essentially six floors of Smilo Cancer Hospital, sometimes in with just 28 hours notice, transitioning outpatient units, um, and across it all, recognizing Kim and Kevin's leadership, the sort of litany of people involved uh, across the entire enterprise, uh, all of whom on this call should take great pride. One other aspect that I think we recognized from the pandemic was how I think we expanded communications for the better. Through town halls, through our regularly email communications, through other forums, um, and I think in the process engaging staff in ways that we needed to learn from. And one thing that I want to continue uh, long after this event is over. At the same time, I think, and I want to really uh, thank many people who were involved in a series of patient and family forums because patients were scared uh, and we knew that cancer care was essential and we needed to also make sure that people showed up for their appointments they continued with their care this was our first event i believe uh, in march we had 500 people 500 patients and family members attend online i think ultimately five to seven thousand watched uh, the recording uh, and these were things we continued to help ensure individuals that, um, that in fact, uh, it is safe to come back and they should continue with their care. We also uh, remained committed to the research mission, recognizing that we had to do a lot of things we weren't um, particularly uh, thrilled about, like suspending clinical research operations temporarily, uh, closing laboratories, but I, I want to really thank a number of people, three of whom you see here, Joyce Tull and Roy Decker, who lead our CTO, and Stephanie Helene, who, reads the, who leads the Clinical Research Support Lab, who in the process of figuring out how to keep our staff safe and our, our regulatory elements and other things uh, up to date, pivoted to, uh, to address the opportunities and the needs to understand this virus uh, and to leverage those resources to enable our institution to study and learn. Um, I also want to recognize the fact that um, people pivoted to think about new opportunities to get grant funding. Um, you all may remember the story that I, I believe was either March or April, when Dan DeMeo and I were informed on a Sunday night that the, uh, the National Cancer Institute was going to uh, solicit a request for supplements for COVID research from cancer centers. On Sunday night, uh, Dan and I communicated, realizing the deadline for our supplement was Friday. And, you know, I think we're all guilty of rushing through grant preparation. I don't think we've ever done it in four days. But what happened was the response of our community was extraordinary. Namely, we got over 30 teams applying for submitting proposals for this process. We ultimately, uh, we had deadlines at 11 p.m. We had review committees leading, review meeting the following night. And on the close of business, four days later on Friday, we submitted an application that was funded. Um, and I think advanced uh, the great work that's going on here. And I want to thank Dan and his leadership in this, and also the many individuals who were involved in that application. As well, so many of our researchers really pivoted uh, and deployed uh, their laboratories and their bench research and their efforts to really addressing the, the need to understand, prevent, treat, 
and understand the biology of COVID-19. Three individuals of which there are many were Roy Herbst, Albert Coe, and Akiko Iwasaki, who um, working with, uh, with Wade Schultz and others built databases, um, you know, leveraged a variety of resources, including uh, the Cancer Center, to uh, really do a lot of very high profile things that I think we recognize the impact, including obviously the very high profile development of a test that can be done on saliva. The, the work uh, studies published just recently in Nature, this one really understanding the, uh, the immunology of individuals who fare well or don't uh, from this virus and understanding where the deficiencies are, which hopefully will inform not only prevention, but treatment. And more recently, this uh, additional publication in Nature that understands the male-female differences, but I think not only, I think nicely addresses the, uh, the understanding of why men and women have a slightly different uh, outcome, but also potentially informing the biology of this disease. I also want to recognize yet another great example, the work of George Goshua, Alex Pine, and the leadership of Alfred Lee in rapidly pulling together data, recognizing the very serious coagulopathies that these patients suffered, understanding it and publishing this very important paper in Lancet Hematology that I think not only understands biology, but provides very practical approaches to how we prevent clotting and coagulopathies in these very sick patients. Well, ultimately, as you know, we, um, we did finally uh, uh, achieve uh, prevention and, and reduce the, uh, the impact of this virus such that our census is considerably no, uh, lower. And we are beginning to approach some measure of normalcy in the context of living through this pandemic. Um, and part of that was pivoting now from uh, response to what we initially called recovery and now transformation. This is an effort now that uh, Kim and Kevin are leading that we've talked about in which we on the clinical enterprise focused on four domains, how we uh, transform the inpatient work the outpatient work, um, supportive care and specialty programs, and integral in this is clinical research. That is, although this was a, a clinical initiative, we knew that clinical research, clinical trials is such an important aspect of what we deliver to patients to make sure that was integrated with this. And what these teams are actively doing is recognizing what did we learn from our response, how can we take the things that went well and take them in, make them part of our routine uh, care and practice? And also, how do we sort of blank slate? We moved out of Smiler. We, we closed down care centers as, that were, as we reopen all of these elements. How do we actually revisit the way we do business in a way that actually for the next decade and longer allows us to be better, stronger, and more effective in what we're trying to do? At the same time, recognizing the pause that a lot of all this did to our research enterprise, we really tried to redouble efforts to continue momentum, um, including obviously thinking about how we look at our clinic research program. Um, I'll talk uh, in a moment about how we focused on expanding our translational research infrastructure. Throughout the pandemic, we were asking our research program leaders to provide strategies uh, for the coming years to really think strategically about how we can expand the impact of our research programs. We realized that the interactions between our research programs and our clinical research entities, the DARTs, is something that we wanted to, uh, to expand. And so we created in the midst of all this, a committee to look at engagement where they've offered specific recommendations that we'll talk about. We realized that, um, there's a need, as I'll touch upon, to really promote team science. We have excelled in individual science, R1 funded science, but I think we don't fully leverage the ability of bringing together talent towards uh, addressing a pivotal research question in cancer care research. And so in the midst of it, we launched the team science, the team challenge awards, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then no less importantly, um, the, we realized that we needed to continue to think carefully about how we address the needs of our trainees. 
uh, across the entire enterprise, um, particularly during the challenges that we now live under, uh, and a committee that Harriet Kluger and others focused on about trainee engagement. You know, turning initially to just where we've been and where we're going on the clinical enterprise, these are the data that existed, well, frankly, just prior to recognizing we were in the midst of a pandemic. We closed this last year with 236,000 office visits, uh, similar growth in infusion, in uh, radiation therapy across the entire enterprise. I think continued growth, recognizing that the value proposition of this cancer center and this cancer hospital is so profound that we have been ever uh, responding to a growing demand of patients who are seeking care and innovation within our center. Um, obviously, what we saw following uh, the pandemic was a substantial drop in our volume. But in fact, we recognize that cancer patients need care whether there's a pandemic or not. And albeit our, our volume dropped, it really dropped so in the context of other elements of the health system, it dropped modestly. And I think the fact that we were able to achieve this visit volume in the midst of everything going on is really a reflection of the very talented people that work in our institution. Well, what we've seen since that peak census in April is now a resumption, a return to uh, the volumes we saw pre-pandemic. And although they're not completely uh, where they were pre, uh, they're approaching it. Um, you can see similar trends with radiation therapy, with surgery, uh, and our, frankly, our inpatient census is now continuing to grow. And as we think about the transformation teams, uh, and as we return uh, to a new normal, I think it's gonna be really important to think about how do we address this growing demand in a way that uh, provides, except con continue to provide exceptional care to our patients, but also makes the work easier for us to accomplish the great mission. We've had a banner year with recruitments, and in these two slides I'm gonna show you 24 individuals of which we recruited considerably more in this year uh, to the Cancer Center. And while I, uh, time uh, prevents me from really reviewing each of them, and I'm frankly proud of each of the talented individuals we brought on, just want to highlight a few. I've mentioned Kim and Kevin, but Pam Coons, who recently joined us uh, to lead the, uh, the GI cancer uh, program, and uh, really off to a great start, having had a, a great forum for the entire community in GI cancer just last Thursday. Mayor Gulshan who has joined us in a new role, uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer for Surgical Services, recognizing the essential need of, of our multidisciplinary care plan and how we can bring surgical services, expand surgical services, working with all the surgical departments, not only on this campus here on York Street, but across the entire network and enterprise. And at the same time, there is a you know, very talented an accomplished uh, surgeon in breast cancer and, and serving now as our interim director for the breast program. Bob Bona, who um, uh, joined us recently as the director of benign hematology. Uh, and I'll talk a moment about Marcus Mushin, who really uh, is gonna bring, uh, really expand our research department in, in extraordinary ways. But, you know, just a number of, of talented individuals and I, you know, for those folks who didn't make it to this slide, who were recently joined us, my apologies. I, I think that uh, I'm really proud of the fact that so many members of our community were uh, able to continue with our aggressive recruitment plan, despite the challenges that we faced uh, this year. We, um, I think we remain committed, pandemic or not, to continue to think about how do we address the needs of our clinical enterprise that continues to grow? How do we provide better care, value, you know, more valuable care to our patients? How do we address the needs of our staff in trying to deliver care and the demands put on them? Um, and I think part of that um, starts with looking at our inpatient service. Um, Roy Herps, Karen Adelson, Ann Chang, 
among others, led an inpatient service optimization effort that, that started before the pandemic, and I think came up with a, a number of important recommendations, which is that we, we have the opportunity to move more care out of the inpatient setting into ambulatory. And I think uh, Stuart Seropian and folks in the, uh, in the transplant unit probably recognize that's an opportunity, that we have to do it right, we have to do it safely. But I think there's elements of can we, uh, is there care that we can allow patients not to have to be admitted and be able to be at home? We need to make sure that we, uh, we enable discharge from the hospital in an easier way with post-acute care, home services, care coordination. Clearly, end-of-life care is a major source of inpatient referral. I uh, heard from Jen Capo this morning about her vision for expanding palliative care, which I think is critical. Um, and I think as well, how we look at our staffing models. That is, what, 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 what physicians should be staffing the inpatient service? How do we look at the way we staff this? I think these are important questions that we are moving quickly on now um, as we think about our inpatient optimization, because I think all of this um, is gonna address fundamental needs, particularly given the financial challenges we now face in the wake of COVID which is we need to reduce our length of stay. I'll be honest, the length of stay of Smilo is, is, is longer than it is at other major cancer centers. And that's something that, is, uh, that we all recognize, but at the same time, something we wanna to do to get patients out of the hospital faster. How do we reduce readmissions, reducing preventable admissions, and ultimately realize that we are constrained by doing these things, ultimately expanding bed capacity such that ultimately, we improve end-of-life care, we improve the patient experience, and enhance, no less importantly, the experience of all our staff and providers. And to say that, that, to make it clear, I think the care that is provided today at our inpatient service is extraordinary. The ability of this service to continue, whether it move to St. Rayfield's or move back to, to, uh, to Smilo or anywhere else across the domain, I think reflects the resilience of the people providing care. And I think what we want to do is enable our caregivers to provide even better care on the inpatient service and to achieve these goals, uh, fundamental goals uh, for our institution. I think as well, uh, we recognize the opportunities even pre-pandemic about um, how can we further optimize the way we deliver care on the outpatient setting. Uh, and I want to recognize the work of Ann Chang and Maureen Major Campos, who lead our outpatient ambulatory transformation committee, as well as Sarah McGallion, who uh, recently assumed the role of our chief ambulatory officer in, in the midst of all this. And they, uh, in conjunction with many other individuals, are now focused as part of the transformation effort about how do we look at all elements of this. This was a slide that they shared with me just last week about the various subcommittees that they have looking at the environment and facilities, the way we deliver care, patient access, a really important initiative, staffing, technology application. And I think in each of these things, we need to think about some of the simple things that we sometimes feel challenged in terms of scheduling, how we get patients in faster, how we uh, look at the, the way we address the needs in the course of our day providing outpatient care. Um, one thing I think that we know that we need to always excel at and do better at is how do we engage and communicate with the broader community. And I want to applaud the efforts of this committee and Anne and Maureen and their leadership in conducting uh, various surveys, forums to get feedback. Um, to their last count, they've engaged 700 individuals to get feedback about how we do this better. And I know that these subcommittees and the main committee are working tirelessly to put together the recommendations. And I think we look forward to what will be the next chapter of our very successful outpatient uh, enterprise. You know, I, as I mentioned to you, I think a value proposition for us going forward is multidisciplinary care and our disease centers. Clearly the engines of our clinical research, outreach, and education in a disease-focused manner. 
Lori Pickens, who has really been an extraordinary partner for me in leading this cancer enterprise, and I were uh, excited about bringing on Kevin Vest and transi transitioning Kevin uh, into a new role, which was vice president for disease centers. And Kevin, in really uh, doing this, uh, spoke to countless individuals to get feedback. Obviously, we uh, recognize that these disease-focused groups are committed to advancing care, the scientific agenda. It's also worth mentioning that the National Cancer Institute has now recognized that um, these disease programs, beyond the research programs, are going to be a fundamental assessment tool for how our grant is reviewed. And so we clearly need to ensure that we have robust programs across all of these, these uh, cancer types that can excel in each of the domains of our mission. Um, and I think we also have to recognize, akin to one of my earlier slides, that there is a broad community. This is an example that Kevin put together for the breast program, but I think this is true for each of our programs. So many disciplines, uh, so many areas of expertise that really need to come together to advance all aspects of the mission for breast cancer. And so we really want to launch in the uh, coming months a new chapter for our disease programs that sort of puts together the various silos in clinical and research, education, outreach, to have disease centers that really serve as our service lines in cancer for innovation, for developing strategy, for leveraging multidisciplinary care and team-based research, to be inclusive, that is to work across all sites of care, all disciplines, all providers, um, and inclusive of research and the other components of our mission. Um, and then no less importantly, not only to serve as the engines to execute in our signature of care, but the engines of our translational clinical research, engaging our research programs in terms of educating the next generation, and no less importantly, in terms of outreach programs to our communities. What we're anticipating is really identifying individual leaders for these disease centers, where uh, at the same time there is leaders, at least in the clinical domain and the research domain, and that there be forums, not only for a director's council, but a clinical council, a research council, where Kevin and his team, where there are administrators supporting each of these disease centers can actually work strategically. At the same time, we know that the cancer center is an amalgam across multiple departments. And so this clinical chairs council is, will be critical as our, our principal advisory board in, in, in sort of as we uh, continue to advance the mission and think about the governance of what hopefully will be a much more coordinated and strategic effort that enables our disease programs to truly excel to the potential they really have. Uh, you know, a, a very important component of our success, of course, is our network. I think one thing that differentiates us is our recognition that 12% of cancer patients get their care at urban academic centers in the United States and 85% get it in the community. And whereas I think some cancer centers have taken the tact of, well, we'll be really good at taking care of the 12% and potentially try to grow beyond that. I think what we've done is extraordinary in terms of the mission of no patient should have to travel more than 30 minutes to get destination expert cancer care. Um, we've continued to grow our network. As you recall, we've, in this year, we launched Smile at Greenwich, Smile at Westerly, and, and I think as well, uh, looked carefully at how do we uh, deploy important resources throughout the network. I think in the coming year, we're committed to continuing to integrate all of these sites with these evolving disease centers across the mission to continue to expand disease-focused expertise and across disciplines in each of the sites to further expand our clinical trials portfolio. This group of our, our care centers now are responsible for 25% of our in trial enrollments and how do we further enable them to do uh, more complex studies? Uh, and how do we continue to think about new partnerships and sites to uh, continue to have this important impact to deliver what we have to offer to a broader community 
of patients. Today, or at least just prior to the pandemic, the statistic was the following. 48% of newly diagnosed cancer patients in the state of Connecticut are seen at some point at a Yale Smilo facility. I think that's an extraordinary reflection of the extraordinary work that you all do. Another important aspect that I, I think we can't recognize enough is the importance of engagement. Um, we've talked about a lot about in the past few months for good reason, diversity inclusion, how we can have greater transparency with our broader com community about what we wanna do in our decision processing and a shared decision process, how we share data, dashboards and develop shared strategy and how we build a, a culture of excellence and innovation that uh, engages all in that. And I'll, I think a key element of this uh, among others, uh, certainly the work that Kim Susser is doing through her work as Vice President for Patient Services and the recruitment uh, this year of Tara Samp as our Chief Experience Officer. Tara, as you may know, launched uh, several months ago during the pandemic, our Faculty Communications, Culture and Engagement Committee, which um, has been meeting through much of the past three months uh, and actually is preparing their final readout in terms of how we can address this fundamental need to recruit, retain, mentor, promote faculty, staff, trainees, and ensure diversity, inclusion, well-being, communication, and engagement. Um, I think the pandemic has taught us opportunities to do better in communication in terms of town halls, forums, staff meetings, communication through email and others. Um, we, uh, uh, Roy uh, Decker and his leadership of the CTO, Clinical Trials Office, is launching shortly the faculty, and I would say probably not faculty, but advisory council on clinical research, which actually will have not just faculty, but a broader community um, to advise us and to be part of the decision process of how we conduct clinical research in our cancer center. We've expanded our listening forums. I've expanded my regular director's lunches, and I really appreciate everyone who's attended and give us those forums. Tara has launched a series of office hours with various groups across the domain. Um, we're looking uh, at the compensation models and how we can particularly focus on greater professional development organization, how we engage broader communities in strategic planning uh, and recognizing our staff through a variety of other forums. Um, and as I mentioned, and I will talk about how we further expand trainee support and no less importantly, uh, launching, which I'll discuss in a moment, a diversity and inclusion task force. Turning, of course, to the research, uh, a fundamental part of our mission, I think the elements of what we need to be doing are both obvious and paramount. We have to recruit, retain, and promote our talent. We have to make sure that we continue to have a robust clinical operation that allows us to move our science in the clinic, that we have to have uh, continue to grow and expand our research, clinical research operations, to broaden our investment in translational research, to make sure that we have exceptional research programs that only that enable uh, uh, our research mission as well as core resources and new centers that are inventive and allow us to achieve greater things. And finally, to promote uh, in every aspect of what we do, our ability to in innovate across the full spectrum of cancer research. This past year uh, recognized yet a new record of our total direct peer-reviewed funding of $99 million. This isn't total funding, but our direct peer-reviewed funding. And, and obviously, uh, we're just one short of a triple digit, uh, and one that I think, given the programs we have in place, I anticipate we will be achieving shortly. And just reflective of the success of our clinical and translational population and basic research programs. In terms of our clinical trials, well, the past decade has seen enormous growth, enormous growth, but some plateauing in that, and, and something that we, uh, we obviously want to be reflective of. Um, and that was something we were working on pre-COVID. COVID certainly has put uh, you know, an incredible bite in our clinical trials operation. That is starting from zero, which is what we were at during the peak of the pandemic, has been a challenge that Roy Decker and Joyce Tull and others are taking on and slowly getting us back into gear but hopefully doing it in a way that learns how we can do it better. 
recognizing all of that, it was a ban a year in terms of the impact of our clinical research programs. Namely, um, all of these things, these uh, really practice changing uh, trials and publications. And I just not to focus on any of them, but I want to point out the work of Barbara Burtness, who led this Lancet publication looking at checkpoint inhibitors in head and neck, which led to an FDA approval for frontline therapy, courtesy of Barbara's work and the work of our head and neck program. A very novel uh, antibody drug conjugate that Dan Petrolak and the genital urinary program led that led to yet a second FDA approval. Uh, and um, as well, leveraging the PROTECH technology that Craig Cruz led, Dan Petrolak leading that presentation with, I think, real benefit for patients with advanced prostate cancer. And finally, no less importantly, what is a true landmark study that Roy Herbst led, ozomertinib as an adjuvant in EGFR mutated lung cancer, um, which will almost certainly lead to yet a third FDA approval in this year coming out of our cancer center. Some cancer centers aspire to have one FDA approval, three in a year, that is truly unprecedented. Um, but you know, there's work to be done here. Um, and I think we are committed to doing it, which is to look at our staffing models uh, and also to make sure that we right size our regulatory efforts, that we think about how we retain and promote the people that work in our CTO. We have to, we clearly have to improve trial activation. We have to do that through a variety of functions, in terms, including grants and contracts. And I can tell you that throughout the organization at the highest levels of leadership, there is a commitment to do that. We clearly have to look at our portfolio, how we leverage technology to do innovation in terms of our trial design. Um, and we clearly have to expand our biospecimen collection. And finally, and no less importantly, we need to ever engage in ever broader population of underrepresented groups of patients and to always expand the efforts across our entire enterprise and network. Um, you know, we've launched a number of centers uh, and I, I just want to in part recognize the leadership of Marcus Bosenberg as the interim director for our Center of Immune Oncology. Marcus has led a, and the members have led a, a series of important task force that really leverage our, our leadership in immunobiology and immunotherapy, uh, including last year's superb uh, IO symposium and another one this fall, um, generating new grant funding of which this is one example that Marcus and Aaron Ring led in terms of a IO translational network grant uh, and other efforts that are afoot. Um, and we're looking to uh, continued exceptional leadership from Marcus and others to expand this footprint in a, in a very important area of cancer research and cancer care. As well, you know, we've, as part of our efforts to bridge the basic science with our clinical innovation is the need for talented physician scientists, of which we've recruited several. Uh, one thing we wanted to do as part of this footprint that will be housed at 300 George Street um, and what we now uh, name the Center of Molecular and Cell Oncology is to find a great leader, a director for this. And I'm so pleased that uh, recently we recruited Marcus Musch to serve as the director. Marcus, as you may know, has been uh, an incredibly prolific uh, researcher who has been focused on immuno in immunobiology, hematologic malignancies, but as well, I think, has a, an extraordinary track, track record of recruitment, mentorship in his prior institutions. And we're really excited about Marcus's arrival. Uh, later this year. Um, we clearly need to ensure, expand our investment in translational research infrastructure. This is really the short list of the individuals who've committed to what is, as you may know, an ambitious agenda. Early, just prior to COVID, we launched an effort uh, for universal consent where every new patient was consented to have their clinical data, their biospecimens, the genomics entered into a database that was available for research, and we are getting back to that now. As well, um, we are committed to expanding tumor profiling beyond what has been a limited panel, and I really want to cite the work of, of Ed Kafton, Rich Lissitano, among others, 
um, to move us now into the world of whole exomes as part of not only our routine clinical care, but as part of our research database to expand our biospecimen collection and to ensure that these samples are available for research, to build um, a comprehensive data warehouse, a, a, a database that we can all interrogate. Um, Wade Schultz and Alan Chow have done really exemplary work building the computational health information platform where all of these data are gonna be housed and where hopefully by the end of the year, we will be able to test the opportunity to leverage that on not only for defining our clinical strategies, but actually understanding research. And in fact, some of the COVID work really was enabled by the first uh, iterations of this. And lastly, just wanna recognize the work of Roy Herbst and others for uh, supporting great translational research. That investment uh, by the T-TERRS has enabled great things, most notably, Sports, our engines of translation. Um, we uh, just in the past year or year and a half, Marcus and Harriet renewed our skin spore. And just this past month, Roy renewed our lung spore. Two spores that have really done um, really historic work uh, in advancing the mission and understanding of translation of these cancers. And I, I think through the work of Roy and others, we have really expanded the culture to enable more spores. Uh, I want to congratulate Barbara Burtness and the entire uh, program working on, head and neck, on the head and neck spore. It was a tough haul. Um, and albeit uh, unofficially, I think that we, uh, we anticipate looking now at a third spore in our cancer center, which really puts us now increasingly among an elite group. I want to congratulate Murad and Antonio in submitting what was a uh, a truly innovative brain spore. And while we will await the review of that, um, I think it really reflects the great work and other uh, efforts afoot. Melinda Irwin and others have been working on a disparity spore, which um, we'll keep working on. And Pat LaRusso, who beyond her work uh, pulling together the community, working on DNA repair and submitting a spore, I think successfully renewed her UM1 grant to an altogether higher level. And now really among the very few UM1s in phase one now funded by the NCI and by far and away the most elite of all the UM1s in this space. Beyond that, as I mentioned, the key is enabling through core resources, uh, our functional genomics core, the precision cancer modeling core that Marcus Bosenberg and others launched and also to expand our ability to understand metabolism and metabolomics. Pat LaRusso and others have done, have really expanded our effort to develop collaborations with industry, which I think is a great way to uh, share uh, resources, to get access to drugs, technology, and most importantly, or probably equally importantly, funding. And finally, I think I want to reflect our commitment to enabling entrepreneurship. That is, as our researchers enable and develop and discover, we want to make sure that they can move that into companies that will ultimately take this uh, beyond just the laboratory and move it into the clinic. Um, team science has clearly been a critical aspect of what we're trying to do this year. Um, you know, we, um, we, I think, are somewhat limited in our program project grant portfolio in the Cancer Center. And I think given the sheer talent and our success in our one funded shop, team science is something we have to do in addition. I want to thank Don and Gary for their leadership in launching the Team Challenge Awards, of which uh, we had their, our very first iteration, adding beyond our extensive pilot program. We received so many exceptional applications. And in fact, um, just recently announced on Friday, we funded five, and I think key areas of epigenetics and immunotherapy, the microbiome, novel IO targets, obesity, metabolism, and cancer, and drug resistance. Pivotal research domains that we have the talent to build world-class teams around. Um, and I think what's interesting is it really matches on Friday, if you may have noticed, Ned Sharpless, the NCI director, uh, offered up his four priorities for the coming year, namely drug resistance, 
diagnostics, obesity, cancer, and survivorship. So I think what we're doing aligns with Ned's uh, vision for the coming year. Uh, and if you want to hear more about Ned's vision, I will remind you that our next Smilo Town Hall on Wednesday, September 16th, will host Ned Sharpless, who will obviously offer his thoughts and be available to answer your questions. Um, really recognizing the, uh, the talent that you have here, the young talent, I think clearly a key element is training the next generation. Uh, want to recognize the leadership of Harry Kluger as well as David Stern and others for our education training uh, faculty development committee for the Cancer Center. We've been very fortunate to have a number of outstanding training grants to support our mission. Uh, ones we continue to expand with recently a T32 for our hematology oncology fellowship and just recently a new T32 that Melinda Irwin uh, was successful in getting in cancer epidemiology. As well, we are committed to working with donors to expand the resources for both our trainees and junior faculty uh, to continue to support their work. And one thing we decided to do just uh, this month was at our annual conclave, which will be held in a virtual fashion in January, where we hand out a number of awards recognizing the achievements, will be two new awards, excellence in teaching and excellence in mentoring, to, to really to recognize how important this is. I also want to recognize one of the great educators at Yale, Alfred Lee, who received, I think, virtually every award Yale has to offer in education, who recently took on the role of leading our hematology oncology fellowship program. Alfred has a bold new vision for how we advance education in cancer care and cancer research, and we're really pleased uh, to be working with Alfred in moving that forward. I mentioned how important outreach is. Um, and uh, I mentioned probably at an earlier forum, our goal to expand community engagement and health equity through this program that uh, both the hospital and the school have invested in, which includes analytics that better, better understand our communities, how we engage communities, how we focus on our screening and prevention programs, our clinical trial participation, particularly for underrepresented groups, and how we inform and enable our research programs to better serve our communities. Beyond the great work that Beth and Xavier and Andrea have been doing in this space, we were so fortunate to recruit Marcella Nunez-Smith, a sort of international leader in this space, to now serve as our director. And Marcella has been sharing and talking with people, her vision, and really excited about how this new program, which she is now naming the bridge program will enable us to better serve our broader communities. Clearly, uh, diversity and inclusion, a very important topic before the pandemic, before the events of this year. Um, we had met with Darren Lattimore to think about how we expand diversity, inclusion, engagement in our workforce in the cancer enterprise. I'm pleased to thank Harriet and Kevin working with Darren to lead a task force of which many of their recommendations are now emerging. One is to create a new role of an associate cancer center director for diversity, equity, and inclusion um, with, I think, a broad uh, list of tasks. We are sort of finalizing this effort. I think this is really the beginning of what will be a continued committee for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and one that we are committed to advancing as part of the fundamental pillars of our cancer center and cancer hospital. And finally, I think sustainability is an important thing to recognize. We, uh, we clearly are looking at major challenges financially in the wake of COVID, um, and that's not any different in our cancer enterprise. We've been uh, successful financially uh, to support the mission of this cancer center and one that we don't want to deter or defer. So we have to continue to look at our sustainable business plans, to look at, to measure all the things we're doing, to, to aggressively pursue new grant funding opportunities. And I think some of our pilot programs, including the Team Challenge Awards, will enable new grant funding opportunities. And I applaud all of those who have been submitting new grants, as well as look at our philanthropic fundraising to further expand the investments we can make in this important mission. 
And finally, we started the year actually in the first week in February, a town hall to launch our cancer strategic framework, our 10 year strategic plan for SMILO. We had to put that on hold, but let me tell you, um, the work we're doing will, will clearly support that larger mission. And we anticipate, Lori Pickens and I anticipate as in the coming months, resuming that and getting back to the long-term plan of, of thinking about the years ahead. So in sum, I want to say we've had an extraordinary year. And I'm just wanted to say that in many respects, this academic year was, for lack of a better phrase, our finest hour in, in terms of our continued commitment to excellence and innovation in the clinical enterprise. And so many of you need to be credited for what you've accomplished in this pandemic to continue what is an extraordinary year of research that spanned the breadth of investigation, to leading development of new scientific paradigms and practice changing innovations, Commit our commitment to training, education, professional development, diversity, inclusion, things that we have to redouble and, and our continued commitment and to uh, enter into this new decade of greater impact. How did we get here? How did we achieve that success? Well. It's the people. Uh, and I just want to thank all of you uh, for allowing me the privilege to work with you and to thank you for what has been an extraordinary year in our cancer center. So I uh, thank you. I, I ran a little bit longer than, than I, uh, I anticipated. But um, let me just uh, stop here. And maybe we have a few minutes for questions, perhaps through the chat line. So. I'll stop in a moment and see if there are questions from the audience. Well, let me just say that, uh, you know, for those of you who are potentially looking at the chat function, I just want to say that, um, you know, there's things I didn't cover here. Uh, and even though I ran for a good part of the hour, um, there's clearly opportunities to, uh, to get feedback on this, as well as ask questions about the things that are clearly important that I didn't have an opportunity to address. So I, you know, I wanna be clear, people should feel free to, to, um, to reach out to me, to Lori Pickens, to our other members of our leadership team. And Renee, I think one thing we, uh, I, I know we have is, is the ability to, our suggestion box, right, um, which is continuously monitored, right, Renee, and that, that site, can you remind us of that site, Renee? Canceranswers at yale.edu. Right, thank you. And Renee just actually put that in the chat line. Well, um, it's 12.59, I, I appreciate everyone joining us. Um, I covered a lot of ground, um, and I think it's not easy to actually have a conversation in this forum, but I look forward to forums that we will be able to do that through the director's forums, the town halls. So um, please stay in touch. Remind me to listen. I'm here to listen. Uh, and join us for the town hall with Ned Sharpless, where I look forward to hearing Ned's uh, plans and and his interest in answering our questions about what we want to do in this cancer enterprise. Congratulations to all of you on exceptional AY 1920, and I look forward to an even greater academic year 2021. Appreciate your joining us for this restart of Grand Rounds, and I'll see you all on campus on Zoom and next week's Grand Rounds. So thank you all. Have a good day.